Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's HRI talk. My name is Hilary Dort, and I'm the communications manager at HRI. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. For those of you joining us for the first time, HRI talks present new ideas, discoveries, and studies that are helping to transform the mental health and substance use health landscape in Canada and beyond. This evening's presentation is centered on the subject of concurrent mental health disorders, which are defined as co-occurring substance use disorder and other mental health conditions. We are pleased to have 335 registrants tonight, including people from across Canada, the US, and the UK, New Zealand, and Australia. So welcome everyone. Please note that closed captioning and live transcription have been enabled for this event. If you would like to use these features, you can click the closed caption or CC button on your Zoom display. I'd like to begin this evening by sharing that the offices of HRI are located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Ottawandaran, Haudenosaunee, and Métis peoples, and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We support the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action, and we are continually working to be more inclusive in our research and our everyday practices. We want to do our part to promote reconciliation and healing, and we invite any input you may have on how we can do better going forward. We invite you to share your land acknowledgements in the chat, or you can simply share where it is you're joining from this evening. So for those of you who aren't familiar with HRI, we conduct applied research with a goal to improve mental health and substance use services in ways that can benefit more people sooner. We work with leading scientists, clinicians, and people with lived and living experience from across Canada and beyond. As a registered charity, donations do play a vital role in supporting our research and amplifying our impact. We ask that you consider making a donation today. You can go to our website and click the donate button. Thank you. The format for this evening is a brief presentation from our three panelists, followed by a moderated conversation. This will take approximately 30 minutes. After that, we'll shift to live questions from our audience. We'd love to hear from you. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation. We'll get to as many questions as we can before we wrap up at eight o'clock. Please note that we have shared a code of conduct for panelists and for guests in the chat box. Let's ensure this remains a safe space for sharing and learning. And finally, before we begin, I'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to our corporate sponsor, CIBC, and our supporting sponsors, KPMG and the Otsuka Lundbeck Alliance. HRI Talks would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Sid Kennedy, Executive Director of HRI. Dr. Kennedy is a professor of psychiatry and the Arthur Summer Rottenberg Chair in Depression and Suicide Studies at the University of, Sur of Toronto. Thank you very much, Hilary, for that uh, overview and kind introduction. Uh, our objectives for tonight are threefold. We want to recognize the gaps and challenges in diagnosing and treating concurrent disorders. We uh, want to explore the latest research on creating more personalized treatment approaches. And we want to raise awareness of innovative treatments and opportunities for the future. So first I'd like to introduce you to our three panelists. Dr. James McKillop is an HRI sci senior scientist and Peter Boris Chair in Addiction Research uh, and Professor uh, in the uh, Department of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at McMaster University. Dr. Yelena Chorney is an HRI collaborating clinician and the Chief of Addiction and trauma services at the Homewood Health Center in Guelph. Dr. Christian Schutz is a professor uh, at the University of British Columbia in the Institute of Mental Health. 
and uh, a clinician working at Radfish Healing Center in British Columbia. So this is our uh, age use of mental health disorders. Uh, the slide is really designed to show the interaction here between substance use, depression, and trauma as an example of co-occurring disorders. Next slide, please. Our various um, players in different aspects of treatment tend to use different terms. And what you're not seeing is the example here, you are now, thank you, of concurrent, co-occurring, and comorbid as terms that are used almost interchangeably preferred in some countries, uh, one over the other. But the, the point is that a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder may co-occur or be concurrent or comorbid. So don't get too excited if our panelists use different terms at different times. Next slide. So this is really just to say that alcohol is the most commonly used substance in Canada. Uh, the rate of cocaine use in people aged 20 to 24 is on the increase. Uh, cannabis use and addiction rates have actually not changed following legalization. One of our panelists will probably highlight that. The rate of emergency department visits for opioid overdoses has doubled for younger adults. And I think sadly, many people are aware of that. And lastly, there's been an increase in the methamphetamine related deaths. And these are uh, comments based on a presentation from the Calgary Dream Center. And finally, I just want to illustrate a sample of a substance use uh, overlap with depression, where we, one thing we do know, as this slide is delayed and coming, one thing we do know is that women have depression uh, twice as often as men. But when we look here, uh, and this is actually based on an overview of about 20 different uh, publications right across the world, three of which were Canadian studies. So men have a much higher uh, prevalence of comorbidity in depression and substance use. You can see about 36%, one in three, while women have about 20% uh, likelihood of having comorbid, co-occurring, concurrent uh, depression and substance use. So I will hand over at this time to uh, Dr. James McKillop uh, to follow on in his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. It is great to be here. My pleasure to be a part of uh, HRI Talks tonight. Um, what I want to tell you a bit about is our work at Homewood Health in collaboration with the clinical team in the Addiction Medicine Service to build what is referred to as a living health system. And uh, a living health system is different from most healthcare settings, which are downstream recipients of research and epidemiology and are practitioners of care based on evidence, but are not necessarily the primary generators of evidence. And using this schematic from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, a living health system can be understood as a health system where there's a continuous feedback loop where information is gathered about the way care is delivered, about the patients, about the clinicians, about the, the, the patterns of outcomes that feed back to improve care in a continuous cycle. So practice gives rise to data, data gives rise to evidence, that evidence is fed back into practice. This is harder to do than it may look in this simple schematic, but what we've really tried to pioneer in the collaboration between Homewood Research Institute and Homewood Health and the Addiction Medicine Program is a platform where the program itself is always learning and growing from the care it's delivering to optimize the care it's giving to the patient today, but also to improve the care that's being offered to the patient tomorrow. So what does this look like in practice? Well, we use something called measurement-based care. And I think that there might be an animation that would put that up top. But in any case, measurement-based care refers to the delivery of 
brief electronic batteries of assessments that help us take stock or measure a patient's characteristics. This may seem relatively straightforward, but it has a, a remarkably powerful impact because when we universally collect data from patients using validated measures, we can feed that information back to improve patient care, to improve diagnostic uh, dispositions, to get better uh, prognostic prediction, um, but we can also use those same data to improve the quality of the care by understanding the nature of the patients that the program is serving uh, and conduct uh, program evaluation and, and quality improvement initiatives. And finally, the same data can also be aggregated over time to create powerful data sets to provide incisive perspectives on clinical programs and different populations to advance new knowledge via clinical research. And really, this is a, a system for uh, empowering a program to understand the patient, to understand the nature of the program and its milieu, and to improve clinical care. Okay, so what does measurement-based care for substance use disorders look like in practice? Well, imagine on the left-hand side of your screen, you have standard care where at, for example, the addiction medicine program, you've got lots of different patients with lots of different characteristics. Most of healthcare is organized around specific conditions. It might be mood disorders, anxiety disorders, or substance use disorders. And so the focus is typically primarily on one condition. But within any given treatment program, there's a lot of heterogeneity or variability across people. And even though programs try to maximize their personalization, typically there's a core program that is essentially a one-size-fits-all one approach. What measurement-based care proposes is to use different assessment modalities. This could be nutrition, it could be brain via MRI, it could be genetics via uh, DNA, it could be liver function or uh, any uh, of a number of different modalities. We use self-reported, patient-reported outcomes. But in any case, the focus is using assessments to then identify regularities in the patient population or ways that the patients look similar to each other and to then improve personalization of care and in turn optimize outcomes. So in this schematic on the right side of the image, you can see that if we analyze the data that come in, we can then aggregate our patients into four different categories. And by doing this, measurement-based care moves us away from one size fits all to which size fits best. Well, this may look simple, but in practice, it, it actually can be quite complex. And what we've had to use is advanced statistical modeling in order to take the data from patients and over time analyze the data to find latent profiles. And these four different categories that you see are not metaphorical categories. They're actually the result of more, more than 2,000 patients at Homewood Research, I'm sorry, Homewood Health's Addiction Medicine Program who were analyzed first to explore the nature of the heterogeneity and then to confirm what we saw in the first study. And what we found was that over time, there were four consistent patterns that came out. One group was really high in alcohol severity, but didn't have other psychiatric comorbidities. Another group was high in alcohol severity, but did have other psychiatric comorbidities, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. A third group was high in uh, illicit drug severity, but not alcohol and did not have comorbidities. And a fourth group was high in illicit drug severity and did have psychiatric comorbidities. So we saw this very consistent pattern of both groups that were high in severity and groups that were high in comorbidity. And that has now given rise to some important changes that have happened in terms of the clinical programming that my colleague at Homewood, Dr. Yelena Chorney will tell you more about now. The take home message here is that this approach of measurement based care really is a way to promote personalized treatment for individuals and to create new care paths for what we know are the common comorbidities that happen in substance use disorder treatment. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. McKillop. And I'm just uh, happy to uh, hand over. I think this is a nice flow to Dr. Chorney. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. McKillop. You have set this up perfectly, um, almost like we planned it. And um, so uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is, uh, so within our addiction medicine program um, at Homewood, you know, we have recognized over time, we've been running this program for decades. Um, and over time, through our own observations, through feedback from patients and families, 
um, through the work of Dr. McClip's team, um, identifying these, these profiles, um, as well as through just looking at our measurement-based care um, results that we're getting from our patients, we identified a gap in our services. While we had you know, have this long-standing addiction medicine program in which, you know, we've always acknowledged and diagnosed um, concurrent mental health issues like depression or anxiety or trauma. Um, and we've always, you know, provided medical management of those where appropriate. We weren't necessarily fully focusing on the concurrent disorder. Our program historically had been very, very heavily focused on the substance use piece, um, really just kind of touching on, you know, the concurrent um, disorder piece. Um, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you know, at Homewood, we had an, uh, the Integrated Mood and Anxiety Program, um, which was a place where people could go and get treatment for their mood or anxiety symptoms, you know, but not specifically for substance use. And, you know, we had, again, long known this, um, and then we had the data to really show it that there was a need really and an opportunity to create a new program that integrated um, our expertise in substance use treatment and in mood and anxiety treatment. Um, to allow people to get both of those needs met in one place, which we actually know is the standard of care to be delivering those things concurrently so that people can work on them both together. If people have questions about modalities, certainly we can talk about that a little bit later, but just to keep it um, nice and simple, um, our, you know, this new program in which we use our you know, longstanding expertise in substance use treatment, which involves both uh, CBT-based relapse prevention, um, a, a type of therapy called motivational enhancement, um, um, as well as uh, peer support. And we combined that with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy um, specific uh, unified protocol um, in order to treat people's mood and anxiety symptoms uh, and their disorders. And what we see is that um, we have significantly increased in terms of patient satisfaction so, you know, our, our patient satisfaction tends to be high overall to begin with. And what you see here in the lighter purple are our substance use program patient satisfaction numbers. And in the darker purple are the patient satisfaction numbers for our new mood anxiety and concurrent disorders program. You see particularly um, improvements in people who would recommend the program to others, or if people were to need future treatment again, um, an increase in, in the percentage who would actually return to Homewood. This is this, the first six months of our data. And what you can see here really echoes, um, you know, I think what we've known is that offering this type of concurrent treatment really actually speaks to people um, and people are really appreciating that. So we have some comments up here um, from uh, patients who have been in our concurrent disorders and mood and anxiety addiction program. Um, I, in our first couple of months that we started the program, we actually had quite a number of people who had previously been in our substance use program who came back, um, you know, they had relapsed to substance use and they came back and specifically chose to go into the new program. Um, and I would say almost every one of them gave similar comments about really feeling that this new program offered something different, something more, something that was meeting their needs in a different way. Um, you know, we've had, I, I say both staff and patients who have identified that they really feel that, you know, almost all of our patients could benefit from this approach. Um, and we actually in the first year have already doubled our capacity. And now I'm gonna pass it on um, to Dr. Schutz, who will tell you a little bit more about some uh, more novel therapeutic areas. Thank you very much, Dr. Choni. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kennedy for the introduction. I will start out with a overview graph summarizing uh, findings and come current thinking about concurrent disorders. What you can see here is that um, the traditional thinking was that either the mental disorders induces addiction or addiction induces mental disorders. And the question was what came first and what does induce the other uh, disorder? And the thinking has changed that actually addiction is part of the family of mental disorders. And it has been shown that genetics overlap uh, between mental disorders and uh, addiction. So there are similar genes, at least partially, which induce both mental disorders and uh, substance use disorders. Similarly, when you look at um, environmental risk factors like early adverse experiences, you can see that they have impact both on mental disorders and induce both substance use and other mental disorders. So there is quite a substantial uh, overlap 
in the cause of the uh, uh, these variations, so to say, in mental disorders, if it's associated with substance use or not. Furthermore, when you do uh, look at imaging um, summaries and, and look at, I think this uh, picture you can see here in the middle is based on 7,000 patients. What you can see is if you analyze both individuals with mental disorders and with addiction, you see an overlap in core areas which are affected both in mental illness and in addiction. These are areas like the, the, um, the, the um, insula and the, the um, part of the prefrontal cortex. The, the importance is that you have the overlap in, in the symptoms, you have overlap in the, the brain areas uh, which cause these um, disorders, as well as of the, in the risk factors. The research we are conducting is uh, somewhat similar to what you've heard from Dr. Choni and Dr. McKillop. We also do outcome research, but we focus a little bit more on the specifics. Um, one example, I just give one example for each area. The example I want to give is we have a lot of individuals suffering from psychotic disorders. And if you treat psychotic disorders with medication, it can have an impact on the substance use disorder. And we could demonstrate that different medications to treat psychotic disorders have different impact on the additional addiction or substance use disorder. So some of the medication actually help in treating uh, stimulant use disorder, for example, others don't. So the selection of the medication or in order to select medication, it's not only important to look at the primary targeted mental illness, but also on the effect of this medication on substance use disorder. The second part is, so to say, the transdiagnostic approach. Here we're looking across traditional diagnostic boundaries and look at factors which have an impact both on mental disorders and on substance use disorders. I showed you previously that, for example, in the areas which were common for both mental disorder and substance use disorder changes in the brain, these are areas which are related to decision-making. So decision-making uh, issues seem to be underlying uh, both substance use disorders and uh, other mental disorders. Another example is, for example, currently there is a metacognition training developed for psychotic disorders. And we feel that the same approach can help people with substance use disorders. And we are transferring the uh, metacognition training now to also treat substance use disorder because the underlying issues seem to be overlapping. We further have novel treatments such as virtual reality, TMS, and medications. TMS, for example, is also treating different disorders, including substance use disorders. And uh, medication, for example, the um, research on psychedelic medication is now not only done specifically targeting individual disorders, but also concurrent disorders. Overall, the goal is very similar to the goal which Dr. McKillop outlined, namely that we want personalized treatment, tailoring the interventions using unique genetic uh, factors, risk factors, lifestyle, and history, how we do it is actually we use model approaches. We have a huge number of different groups we offer and we select the groups according to the needs of the individual patient. The research I am talking about is being conducted at the Redfish Healing Center for Mental Health and Addiction in Coquitlam near uh, Vancouver. It's a treatment center for uh, individuals with severe concurrent disorder. So all uh, individuals have a severe mental disorders plus the severe substance use disorders. And we are applying an integrated multidisciplinary treatment and recovery approach, which is innovative. And for that reason, it's also important that we do the research to, to show what is working, what is not working.
So thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I think this has been succinct. I commend you for sticking to uh, good timelines. Uh, I'm going to actually pick up, uh, Christian, on your uh, final slide um, where you've suggested, uh, for example, uh, psilocybin, you mentioned as a psychedelic substance, which many people would consider potentially harmful. And yet we have a, a world now of investigating psilocybin as one example as a treatment. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. McKillop, uh, what, what, what do you think about this idea of taking previously banned substances and, and considering them as a treatment? Well, I think what we know is that there is an existing portfolio of interventions that work, and that's the good news. But the bad news is they don't work for everybody, and we still have rates of lapse and relapse that are too high. And what we also know about the existing treatments is there's no silver bullet that will stop substance use disorders. It's typically a combination of different strategies, some behavioral, some pharmacological as was alluded to now, uh, including neuromodulation, for example. I think that we can't stop trying to identify novel strategies. Part of that is psychedelic medicine. Some of the outcomes for psilocybin for tobacco use disorder are better than all of the existing uh, interventions, uh, medications and behavioral interventions, although it's unlikely that magic mushrooms are gonna become the first line intervention for quitting smoking. Um, but the bottom line is we need to continue to push forward for better treatments because even though we've come a long way, we've still got a long way to go. Thank you. So the, I think the message is keep an open mind about uh, and look for the science to support the data. Um, Dr. Chorney, I can remember a time when people, I either thought this is all about a psychological approach to treatment or potentially there are medicines that might work. And I, I remember as far back as antibus as the drug that uh, if, you, if you took alcohol, you, you, it made you sick and you vomited. Um, do you think we've moved into a more integrated uh, approach in, in recent times? Um, thanks, Dr. Kennedy. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think in part it depends on the person and it depends on um, you know what they're looking for in terms of their stages of change. Um, some people, you know, back when I used to do outpatient work, some people, um, you know, were looking for let's say a reduction of alcohol use, or they were looking for harm reduction with respect to let's say their opioid use, and in those cases, medication really plays the 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 biggest role. Um, and then, you know, for people who we see coming into inpatient treatment, typically they're looking for, you know, full abstinence from substances. And they're really looking at a complete, you know, lifestyle change in order to support that. And with, with that group of patients, I would say that, you know, both of those Kind of all of the modalities, as Dr. McKillop said, are important. You know, um, we know that we have medications that um, as he said, are not silver bullets. They're not going to necessarily work for everybody, and they're not going to completely eliminate um, either the substance use or the concurrent disorders to, at, at that, to be honest. Um, but they can make a really big difference, and they can help people get started um, and get them to the place where they're actually able to engage in the psychotherapy and, and in the lifestyle changes that they need. And so I think, you know, all of those things are important together. Um, and for those people, let's say, who are starting from a place of harm reduction and are really making use of medications as their mainstay, I think always knowing that um, they have the option, you know, even if they're going to continue in a harm reduction approach to, to integrate some of those psychotherapeutic pieces as well um, to help them, you know, with their wellness and to work on um, other things that might be impacting their lives in terms of their um, mental illness um, symptoms. Thank you. Dr. Schultz, um, you, you showed that uh, lovely building and I'm thinking of the hydro bills must be quite expensive uh, at, at Redfish. Um, it makes me think of the broad spectrum from um, indigenous uh, treatment approaches to uh, everything. I saw somebody asking about deep brain stimulation and 
one of the uh, questions. Does your center explore some of the more uh, traditional healing uh, experiences? And can you comment at all on the, the sort of uh, indigenous approaches? Yes, we do actually, as I indicated, I have a wide spectrum of uh, treatment, recovery and wellness uh, uh, offers. So we do have uh, indigenous uh, treatment provider who are working with our indigenous population. Um, that is happening regularly. Um, we also do offer uh, um, things like acupuncture, um, and have a wide program. I think there is, it is important that in order to be successful, it's not only important to target specifically the disorder, but have a recovery program, which also gives individuals the opportunity to develop um, new meaning a new kind of like uh, directions, and also often uh, the opportunity to take up uh, old, let's say, positive habits, which, which have been disappearing uh, with the more severe substance use disorder. And so we also offer uh, things like our, uh, art uh, and have a, a therapist on that. We have a gym where people can go and uh, become active. Uh, we have uh, music uh, uh, where you can also record music to, to develop your own, so to say, a new approach. To, to your life. So we, we have a wide spectrum, which goes not only to the specific target of individual disorders, but there is a really very com comprehensive recovery program. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Hillary to uh, take us into some of the questions from the audience. Dr. Kennedy, could I springboard off the previous comments for a second? Sure. So long as it's brief, James. I'll be brief. I just want to highlight Yelena's point that one thing I've really seen in the last 20 years is an increasing focus on patient-centered treatment and really meeting people where they are in terms of what, what they are trying to uh, change in their own lives. And, and complementing that Christian's point that we increasingly appreciate that just not using substances isn't enough. It's about finding meaning and restoring the, the richness of life not just not drinking or using other drugs. And I think that if you go back two decades, the focus was on abstinence only and abstinence as king. And now we meet people where they are and prioritize the, the rehabilitation of the person, not just the reduction of substance use. Thank you very much. And I think that is a very important point to make. So uh, over to you, Hillary. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. So our first question this evening is, what is the value of lived and living experience in regards to assisting others find sobriety? As an addiction recovery coach, I do not work with people clinically, this person says. They cooperate, form an alliance, guide, listen, pool resources, nurture, and strengthen their agency. Would you like to take that one, Yelena? Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. Um, you know, I think so many people who come into treatment, so I'll speak, I'll speak to the inpatient environment, although I think this applies everywhere. Um, so many people come into treatment and they are anxious or nervous about being in a group setting. You know, they they are they kind of express that they wish that they were doing kind of all of their treatment individually with a therapist, um, you know, and not being in a group. And then when they're finishing treatment, and, and I will also say they also expect is, express kind of nervousness around attending any kind of peer support programs, um, whether that's 12 step or smart recovery or um, you know, refuge recovery, there's many different options, but the idea of kind of being vulnerable in a group of other people and, and sharing about their experience um, is really scary. And then when I see people at the end of our treatment process, um, once they've done that for six or nine weeks, um, typically that is the thing that people talk the most about in terms of the place where they feel they got the most benefit is from their peers, either in the program with them um, or from the peers they meet in the peer support community. And so I think, you know, 
there is huge value um, in in having people with lived or living experience um, support those who are going through this process. Uh, and I really think that you know peers, whether those are uh, informal peers uh, through a peer support network, or whether they are formal peers in terms of peers who are you know hired and, and work with an organization, um, uh, make a huge difference um, for everybody. Thank you very much, Helena. Uh, back to you, Hillary. Fantastic. Um, so our next question is, um, are family caregivers of clients in, uh, in the AMP MAC program involved in care planning? Um, and if so, how are they supported? Maybe we could broaden it to just uh, family members in general, not in any one specific uh, program. Or if you like quickly, Yelena, you could uh, take it and then we'll open it up to Christian. Sure, I will say, you know, this is a thing that we continue to work on. I think figuring out how to effectively involve family um, and at what points to involve them. Uh, and I, I use the term family really broadly. That's that's family, depending on how that, that patient or client themselves defines it. Um, uh, within our programs, um, you know, we have, people have the option essentially of involving their family kind of as much or as little as they would like. Um, we have a, um, a kind of developing kind of family, we used to have quite a more extensive family program prior to COVID. And it's a thing that we have been redeveloping in the post kind of during slash post COVID time, um, where there's a bit more kind of formalized support. Um, you know, I think some people want their families involved. Some people, um, uh, don't want their families involved. And then of course, um, uh, many family members really, you know, need actually their own support. Um, you know, they need to be there in supporting and they want to be there in supporting their loved one. Um, and they also benefit from having their own support kind of outside of that, that space. Um, and so those are some things that we're working on um, that are part of our goals at, at Homewood for the next year is really enhancing how we do that. Um, I'd be curious to know from Dr. Schutz how that, how that works um, in his facility. Sure. Um... Connecting to family is often in individuals who have a severe disorder reconnecting to the family because often the connection to the family has been distressed and is problematic. So I think that is one of the emphasis that we are trying to see if we are able to reconnect uh, patients to family members. We are serving individuals from all over the uh, province. So often there's a huge distance, which makes it difficult. So people can come and visit uh, patients or they can also go and visit the family. Our recovery program is fairly long, six months. Uh, so we have also a regular meeting with the community team and often have community coming by. And when we have this meeting, we do invite also family members to participate. So. We, we do a review of the treatment and recovery plan every month, and then uh, we do follow up and see if we can invite family members or friends uh, who are supportive generally. Uh, I think that is a very important um, yeah, often process because uh, a, a large number of our uh, patients have really lost the connection. And uh, so... Um, it is like, um, yeah, just just a stepwise process of integrating them and reconnecting them. Thank you. Next, please, Hillary. Right. Um, so there's a question here about um, reduction of substance use when the substance isn't alcohol or illicit drugs. Is that? Something that anyone can comment on? Something like glue sniffing or uh, others? Are we able to get a bit more context, yeah. Hillary? Yeah. That would include cannabis and tobacco also. Yes. Or, pres or prescription medications. I was going to yeah. say maybe prescription medicine yes. was the direction I was wondering about. James, you want to take that one? Sure. Well, I think that what we know is that uh, 
Substance use disorders can take place for a very wide variety of substances. And whether a, a drug is legal or illegal or originally prescribed for therapeutic purposes or procured from the contraband market doesn't really matter. Fundamentally, people can develop addictions to um, any number of substances and, and often uh, what we also see in addition to comorbidities with other psychiatric conditions is multiple substances being problematical for people. A single drug is the case for one subset of uh, uh, patients, but many others um, have multiple substance use disorders concurrently also, and that's a, that's a real struggle too, even if they have a, a drug of choice. I think that we see this more broadly also uh, going beyond psychoactive drugs. In DSM-5, our contemporary way of diagnosing substance use disorders, we have for the first time gambling disorder, which is a behavioral addiction accompanying the pharmacological addictions. There's also uh, consideration of gaming addiction um, based on uh, accumulating data. And there are increasing calls for uh, binge eating disorder or obesity to be also considered part of a general uh, uh, profile of overconsumption conditions, behaviors in which people fundamentally are no longer able to regulate their consumption of uh, a commodity. And so I think substance use disorders or, or addictive disorders are not simply alcoholism or drug addiction. It, it's a much broader a uh, range of uh, substances and behaviors and uh, extend to prescription drugs as maybe the case here, um, but also to, to, to other categories too. I can't help but uh, follow on with the question. You mentioned gaming, but um, when we look at uh, today and the use of screen time, um, both in communication and in sort of flipping through and so on, do you see that in potentially as an addiction or a, subs a use disorder? Well, I think it's a, it's a discussion in the field. And I think that what we have to be careful about is metaphorical addictions. Like I'm addicted to chocolate or I'm addicted to my uh, telephone and clinical addictions that really require intervention and uh, all the, the resources of the healthcare community. And I think that it is entirely possible that there is both a sense that people can have problematic relationships with video games or, or gambling, and, and that be more of a, a metaphor. And in other cases, it may be that it rises to the level of what we would consider the same severity of alcohol use disorder or uh, another substance use disorder. Now, of course, some of the risks aren't there. There's no overdose risk from gaming addiction, for example, which is why conditions like uh, opioid use disorder are, are so severe and uh, problematical, but, but that doesn't mean that it may not be the case that in some cases, uh, individuals who have that kind of compulsive profile don't also need the same kinds of interventions, especially around uh, coping and motivation the way individuals with substance use disorders do. It's a, it's a blurred line though. Yeah, thank you. Hillary, back to you. Great. So our next question is, um, how does one bring forward or introduce an innovative treatment or practice? Who decides what is studied? Christian. Yes, uh, it's not an individual who decides that. It's always a process. So there is kind of like uh, sometimes uh, finding which are related, as I said, for example, now we know that metacognition is a uh, effective uh, support or intervention for individuals who uh, have uh, pro uh, psychosis. Uh, and um, so the idea is that when we looked at the, the um, uh, interventions that there is a lot of overlap and, and possibility to transfer it to um, um, addiction. The, the process would be that we, we do a stepwise process where we, we test out part of it. We look at, uh, discuss it with the patients, how they feel about it. We run a, a test and then we do, do a study where we kind of like uh, pilot it and, and find out if uh, we, we see the expected outcome. 
And uh, after you, you do a smaller study and you see some effect, you probably want to do a larger study. So this is, this is an ongoing process. It's not like a one-time uh, decision that this might be working or not working. Uh, but uh, it's often a, a, a very kind of like multi-step process in which you go from very simple uh, initial steps to uh, finally transfer it into the uh, clinical practice. Max, and I, I'm, I'm going to just qualify that and maybe ask James. The, the, the lag time from Dr. Schultz's new interesting finding in 10 patients at Redfish to the actual uh, let's say it has a pharmacological component to to the actual approval of the treatment. How long do you think it would be, James, and, and how could we do better? Well, I think the, the, the challenge is, and this has been documented, that it often takes up to two decades for early observation of promising novel interventions to actually get into widespread use. And I think that what, what people often think is that there is a kind of top-down process in which there's someone who decides what works and what the new treatments will be. But just exactly as Dr. Schutz alluded to is, it's a very grassroots, bottom-up process that might start with an observation in an animal model or an observation in a single patient that leads to a case study and then a case series and then an open-label pilot followed by a pilot trial, followed by a randomized control trial, and then the accumulation of evidence ultimately gives rise to an appreciation by the field, but it doesn't stop there because often you need regulatory approval from Health Canada or from other regulatory bodies. You need insurers, whether it be a provincial insurer or a private insurer, to pay for the treatment. So it's a very multi-step process, and unfortunately, it can take literally decades between the identification of new signal that has promise getting from either the lab or a single clinic out into widespread use. And I think that why these living and uh, living uh, learning environments are so important is acceleration of that process and identification of what works in the real world faster and conversion of that information back into practice sooner rather than waiting always for that, that sequential progression, which to be sure is very important, leaves out the real world patients as the last recipient of those innovations that start under more controlled conditions. So really it, it speaks to your point about the learning health system uh, as a way of trying to move this, the cycle around a little bit more quickly. Um, Absolutely. Hillary? So our next question is, which is more often the case? Mental illness leads to addiction or vice versa? And how does that inform treatment? And I could add to that, does one size fit all? Christian, do you want to start? And then Yelena, maybe you have uh, some sure. comments. Uh, it, it actually, I would say it used to be that uh, the people treating the mental disorder were thinking that uh, the mental disorder is the primary and then the development of the substance use disorder is secondary while people working in the uh, addiction field were thinking that the substance use disorder is primary and the mental disorders are secondary. And so they treated the, the one disorder, which was either the mental disorder or the substance use disorder, depending on where they come from, and was expecting that, so to say, the rest would then disappear when they had treated this disorder. We know by now that this is not working and that we need to have uh, uh, an integrated or concurrent treatment of both disorders. And uh, when you look at large data sets, it's actually quite surprising that there is a, not a clear pathway from one to the other disorder. And as I had tried to indicate is, we also know now that there's a lot of overlap between the risk factors, so that it's not really kind of like one disorder inducing the other one, but yes, one disorder can have an impact on the other one, but probably there is a lot of common roots for all of them. Um, jumping off of that, um, with respect to treatment, you know, when I started working in the um, substance use field, what I used to see most frequently was that my patients who had um, concurrent uh, other disorders such as depression or anxiety or, or PTSD um, would be turned down from, you know, any kind of 
treatment options for, let's say, they would be turned down from depression services, they would be turned down from uh, an anxiety treatment, um, not medication necessarily, but but um, psychosocial treatment options, um, because they were told that they needed to be sober for up to three months prior to starting this treatment. Um, and you know, and if you're someone who has both depression and uh, substance use disorder, it's going to be really hard to stay sober. Um, you know, if you're continuing to have that depression. Um, and I see this quite commonly, of course, with my patients with PTSD, you know, if, typically when someone stops using a substance and they have PTSD, um, what actually happens is their PTSD symptoms get worse. Um, the substances to a degree have been masking those symptoms um, and, and helping them cope, you know, maybe not cope uh, in a healthy way, but it but has helped them to kind of numb uh, those symptoms for some time. Um, and so, um, as Dr. Schutz was suggesting, uh, and, uh, and as I think is maybe one of the main points of this whole presentation today, um, we realized we really need to do both of these things at the same time. Um, and so one thing I didn't talk about, you know, in my presentation part today was we've also done this at Homewood for, our, for trauma. So we have, um, you know, multiple programs. And I would say what we're moving to across our organization as a whole is really looking at transdiagnostic treatment models. Um, you know, recognizing that, as Dr. Schutz said, a lot of these um, challenges, be it substance use, be it uh, depression, be it PTSD, um, uh, be it, um, you know, what's called personality disorders, all come from, from similar risk factors. Um, you know, often, not all the time, but often, you know, there are early childhood experiences. Um, there are um, uh, traumatic experiences that present you know, for that person in a way that leaves them with various symptoms that might include depression, might include anxiety, might include substance use. Um, and so if we can find treatment models that are actually targeting all of these things at the same time um, and targeting kind of the core um, brain areas, as well as let's say the core uh, coping that people learn, you know, because of uh, these challenges that they've had, and we're actually going to do a better job of getting to the root of that problem for them. So I'm going to ask uh, James and Christian, uh, you've talked, uh, Yelena, very nicely about often structured inpatient service. Do the same or outpatient programs, or do we need, for the majority of people, do we need residential programs? Christian. Yes, I've been talking uh, about the inpatient program because that's where I'm based and that's where I do research. Uh, but in principle, uh, the, the outpatient uh, services are the first step. Yes. And uh, this is also something which is a continuum. So you will try to uh, deal with the problems in an outpatient service and will only kind of do the step to an inpatient service when it's necessary. So I, I, I think an integrated program again, a system where you can transfer people in from an outpatient to an inpatient and back to an outpatient is important because it is, or these disorders are often chronic disorders. So you continue to, to need support, which might be minimal at times, which might be more intensive at other times, but the continuity is very important. Yeah, can I can I just jump in because I absolutely agree. I mean, I also speak about inpatient because that's where I work right now. Um, yes. But uh, our ideal system would have you know this type of care available on a spectrum, where people could kind of move up or down in intensity depending on what they need. Potentially being residential for two or three weeks and then um, yeah, a, a, a ex, external <laughs> care and then possibly even back in. Is that yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, the residential residential is really only necessary for, I would say, kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, you know, people who have particular symptoms or particular life circumstance. Um, you know, most people get treatment as an outpatient. Yeah. Um, our challenge right now is that, you know, is, is access and availability of that treatment. Um, I'm aware of our time. I'm going to give James the last response here. I appreciate that. I would just echo the point that evidence-based treatment comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. It can come in primary care. It can come in outpatient settings. It can come in inpatient settings for folks who have 
potentially severe withdrawal or other uh, higher needs. I think that the other reality is that we know many people get better via natural recovery, that not everybody ultimately requires formal care. And although we often talk about substance use disorders as being chronic relapsing conditions, many people get better and do not experience uh, chronic uh, outcomes. And I think that what we really need to embrace is all the different evidence-based strategies that help people achieve recovery, whether it be inpatient, outpatient, natural recovery, mutual support organizations like AA or none of the above. And I think that one size doesn't have to fit all for a good outcome. Well, I want to thank the panelists for an excellent discussion and uh, presentations. Uh, I hope it has been uh, helpful to you, the, the audience. I'm, it's, it's a pity we can't see you and interact directly with you, but I think the questions uh, via Hillary have been extremely uh, pertinent to the, to the discussion. So I'd, I'd like to thank you, the panelists, and the audience for their um, engagement. And I'll hand it back to Hillary. Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to note that we will be posting a recording of this HRI talk on our YouTube channel in the coming days. And we invite you to share it with anyone who you think would find value in it. If you haven't already done so, you can also subscribe to our HRI Talks mailing list, um, as well as our quarterly newsletter, or you can follow us on social media to learn more about our next HRI Talk, which will be um, taking place in the fall. And once again, I would like to thank our corporate sponsors, CIBC, and our supporting sponsors, KPMG and the Otsuka Lundbeck Alliance. We are so grateful for our sponsors and to all our supporters across Canada and beyond. Thank you again for being a part of this evening's event. We'll see you again next time. Good night.